Now, let's move on to basilary dysentery. So, we're also going to talk about the overview, the etiology, the mode of transmission of the basilary dysentery, the risk factors, the pathogenesis, the clinical manifestations, the complications, laboratory or diagnostic procedures, the medical management, the nursing diagnosis, and the prognosis. Okay, so let's start with an introduction. So, bacillary dysentery is an acute bacterial disease of the intestines characterized by inflammation of the intestines and bloody diarrhea. It is the most common cause of acute bloody diarrhea and it is the major public health problem in the developing countries where sanitation is poor. Epidemiology So, shigellosis or bacillary dysentery causes an estimated 150 million illnesses and 14,000 deaths worldwide. It's endemic in both tropical and temperate climate. It's the leading cause of infant diarrhea and mortality in developing countries. So, the source of infection are the patients and carriers. So, let's move on to the etiology. So, Shigella strains are gram negative bacteria so there are there are they are facultative anaerobic non motel rats classified in the family of Enterobacter SA. So the causative organism is uh Shigella strains and so they are facultative which means they grow with or without presence of oxygen and they are non motile which means no flagella or and no movement. So Shigella strains cause uh, dysentery by invading and destroying the cells that lie in the large intestines. So there are four subgroups of Shigella species that cause bacillary dysentery. We have four types. And the first one is the Shigella dysentery. It is the most severe infection. The second one is Shigella flexionary. And the third one is Shigella sonae. And the fourth one is the Shigella boidi. So, however, the first three organisms are the most common causes of outbreaks. So, the mode of transmission is, of the disease is the fecal oral route, it is mainly direct or indirect contact with symptomatic patient. Infection may occur after the ingestion of the contaminated food or water transmitted directly through flies or contaminated heads and transmitted there indirectly through dishes of which are poorly washed. So humans are the only reservoir for outbreaks. So the incubation period is uh, short, normally one to four days only. So the 4F's connection shows that uh, how we'll get the condition through a feces that contains the bacteria which is transmitted to flies or dirty fingers which can contaminate the food that we eat so if these are ingested orally then we will end up having the condition so the risk factors of bacillary dysentery are young children because they are more likely to get shigellosis but people of uh, all ages can get this disease. So many outbreaks are related to childcare settings and schools. Ill illnesses commonly spread from young children to their family members and occur in their communities because it is highly contagious. So another is uh, malnutrition. And we also have anal sexual intercourse uh, it is a risk factor because it, we, we all know that uh, bacillary dysentery or shigellosis is transmitted by a fecal oral route. So individuals who engage with anal sex may be exposed to fecal residue. So now there is travelers. So travelers to developing countries may be more likely to get shigellosis and to become infected with traits of shigella bacteria. 
So another is immunocompromised individuals such as HIV positive patients and patients with cancers. They may develop severe and prolonged forms of shigellosis and at high risk of developing bacteremia. So the pathogenesis of uh, bacillary dysentery is that is infection is by ingestion. Shigella then invades the colonic mucosa and local spread of the infecting organism. This causes death of the in intestinal epithelial cells. So Shigella dysentery produces a toxin which heals cells, which means that uh, it is not the actual bacteria that kills the cells, rather the toxin that is produced by the bacteria itself, which is very common to most gram-negative bacteria. Um, so, the mucous membranes of the rest of the colon becomes inflamed and necrotic. So, red bleeding mucosa with patches of necrotic membrane are formed. That lead, it will lead to ulcerated areas of the intestine which leads to our clinical manifestations of sudden and onset of fever and headache. We can also notice an abdominal pain. Uh, because of the release of the toxin of the bacteria, so it will result to fever, headache, abdominal pain, diarrhea, and diarrhea with a uh, mix of blood and mucus because of the destruction of the mucosal layer of the epithelium. So, we can also have tenesmus or uh, the painful cramping of the rectal sphincter which produces an irres irresistible urge to defecate even, even if you already had a bowel movement. So, another clinical manifestations have lethargy, and muscular cramps, oliguria, due to dehydration, which is very common in this condition due to loss of fluid. Then we also have rectal prolapse in infants where the lining of the child's rectum protrudes through the anus and outside the body due to the desmos or, or because they feel the urge to defecate even, even if they already had an empty, even if they have already empty their bowel. So uh, we can also have, infant can also have convulsions due to high fever caused by the toxin that was building up. So next is, so the, the, we have a clear difference of bacillary dysentery and amoebic dysentery. So uh, it is very important that we can differentiate bacillary and Amoebic dysentery. So, with bacillary dysentery, the incubation period is usually short, unlike with amoebic dysentery. And the onset is often acute, and fever is very common with bacillary dysentery. So, the clinical picture so, this refers, this refers with the pain and severity with bacillary dysentery. So, in bacillary dysentery, you will usually lie down due to intense pain, while the amoebic dysentery you can walk, but you may feel some a little bit discomfort. So, with bacillary dysentery, it usually affects the whole abdomen. So, unlike with amoebic dysentery, it is more likely a localized. So, bacillary dysentery is usually very severe. It, the stools in bacillary in bacillary dysentery, usually have mucus plus blood only and pus might be present with uh, might be present. So with uh, amoebic dysentery, stool has blood and mucus. Uh, so micro microscopically, bacillary dysentery has numerous RBCs and numerous polymorphs, while amoebic dysentery has numerous clump RBCs and numerous polymorphs. So additional information, uh, bacillary dysentery is caused by bacteria, while amoebic dysentery is caused by protozoa. Okay, so let's move on to the complications. So com the most common complications of bacillary dysentery is diarrhea, but uh, I mean dehydration. But the other complications include uh, sepsis rectal prolapse, uh, 
we have hemolytic pyramid syndrome, convulsion, especially to children. Um, we have the laboratory and diagnostic procedure. We have a uh, complete blood count to identify there are infection and blood and stool culture to determine or identify the specific bacteria and be treated with a specific antibiotic. We also have sigmoidoscopy. Uh, so it can be used to examine and diagnose certain conditions in your lower colon. This include polyps, tumors, or ulcers, and inflammation or swelling. So the medical management of bacillary dysentery is self-limiting only and only requires rehydration. So the diet includes a soft diet until diarrhea stops the return to normal diet. So if severe infection will require, we have pharmacologic uh, management, we have the antibiotics, uh, specifically oral ciprofloxacin is a drug of choice. And we have analgesics for colic and rehydration due to diarrhea and fluid loss, oral rehydration using ORS in water. We also have IV fluids can be given. Then loperamide to reduce the urge of passing stool, then maintain adequate levels of nutrition. So prevention and control. So Prevention control depends on stopping the fecal-oral transmission through safe water supply, improvement in personal hygiene, especially hand washing, and practicing food hygiene. We should also emphasize environmental hygiene. So the nursing diagnosis include fluid and electrolyte imbalance that's related to active fluid volume loss secondary to diarrhea. Nursing management includes monitor vital signs and CPP measurements, weigh clients daily, monitor intake and output, observe for skin color, temperature, and capillary refill, set up a 24-hour schedule for fluid intake and encourage foods with high fluid content, monitor laboratory studies, and administer IV solutions as indicated. So another nursing diagnosis is hyperthermia related to infectious process secondary to diarrhea. So nursing management include monitor, monitor vital signs, monitor intake and output, encourage increased fluid intake, perform tepid sponge bath, administer IV solutions as indicated, give antipyretics as ordered, and maintain adequate type nutrition. Last nursing diagnosis, we have risk for impaired skin integrity related to increased frequency of diarrhea. So nursing management include weigh clients daily, monitor intake and output, record number and consistency of stools per day, encourage increased oral fluid intake, provide perianal care after each bowel movement, and emphasize the importance of personal hygiene and good sanitation as well as administer, administer medication as ordered. So the prognosis of bacillary dysentery is that overall the prognosis is excellent. With proper treatment, most cases of bacillary dys dysentery subside within 10 days. Mild bac bacillary dysentery, the kind commonly found in developed countries with good sanitation will normally resolve with oral rehydration and in more severe cases, antibiotic drugs are available. So I think that's it. Thank you for watching.